Hi, welcome to another episode of Talking with Docs. I'm Dr. Brad Weening. And I'm Dr. Paul Zalzal. And I'm Dr. John Haverstock. Doctor? Doctor. 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 So today on our episode, we have a, a guest speaker who's going to talk to us about shoulders, a very, very common problem uh, that we're going to try to get to the bottom of today. So John, we're talking about rotator cuff. Yeah. Very common problem? Super common problem. Okay. Let me tell you the format. We basically go with like the three W's. What is it? Yeah. What does it do? Yeah. What can go wrong with it? Yeah. That's actually one W. Yeah. And then what can we do about it? Okay. So what is it? So. Yeah, great question. This is a super common problem. Uh, I see it tons in my office, family doctors, super common. The rotator cuff, I've got a little model here, is a group of four muscles, okay? And these muscles, kind of the reddish parts, start on our shoulder blade, and they travel and they turn into tendons. All muscles turn to tendons, and those attach to the, to the arm bone, the humerus, okay? And these four muscles, their job is to just kind of balance the ball and the socket. It's a pretty small socket. So this is a group of tendons that balances things deep inside our shoulder and we don't appreciate them until something's gone wrong. So just for the audience, this is a right shoulder model that you have. That's right. So okay. this is a right shoulder. It'd be kind of sitting like this. It's very close to real life size where this is our collarbone or clavicle. This is our scapula or a shoulder blade. And then this is our humerus or arm bone and it's uh, kind of just truncated there. So for the kids doing their high school projects, the four rotator cuff muscles would be? So there's a little acronym, SITS. Supraspinatus is the top one, probably the most common to have a tear. Infraspinatus goes behind the spine, teres minor, and then subscapularis. Okay. Flexing a lot of Latin there. There wow. we go. <laughs> okay. So when someone comes to you in your clinic or in your office or at the family doctors, what are, what are they showing up with? They're showing up with pain? They're showing up with pain. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Pain is the most common symptom. Uh, usually it starts out of the blue for most people. They just say, you know, they might attribute it to something, reaching or some yard work, maybe sports, but it's usually coming out of the blue generally and it's very painful at first. Okay. Oh, um... My wife had a problem when she was carrying our baby around a lot. Yeah. She's oh. developed rotator cuff tendinitis. Why don't you do your share and carry the baby a bit? I had, well, I had bilateral rotator cuff tendinitis. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sure you did. Do the lawn. So, John, who gets it? Are, are 12 year olds in your office or are they 80 year olds or is it a little bit of everybody? You know, it's a little bit everybody starting probably in the 40s as a generalization. Okay. It gets more common as we get older for sure. Okay. Um, pain at rest or only with activity? Mostly it's pain with reaching and overhead activities, yep. but as the first flare of pain happens, people have a lot of trouble sleeping, laying on that side, right. and it's pretty constant for the first weeks until they start those basic treatments. Okay. Okay, so we call that basically rotator cuff tendonitis. Yep. That's a common term to use to describe when you get some inflammation of that rotator cuff. Absolutely. And that can progress or be similar to a tear, okay? Um, so there's lots of different things that can affect the rotator cuff but it's kind of like just a continuation from tendonitis, inflammation, to some variety of tear. Okay, I guess it's important to distinguish if you've got a tendonitis or a tear. Yes, so they will both feel the same. Uh, the best way to distinguish is to, to get an ultrasound of your shoulder. Okay. So that can help us decide, is it, which is it? Is it a partial thickness tear or inflammation or a full thickness tear? Okay, so ultrasound's a good test. Yeah. Did you get an x-ray? I would get an x-ray if it's kind of lingering, you know, and people say 45, 50 and over. I think it's part because sometimes we'll go for a while and we won't, uh, we won't realize that there's actually some arthritis going on in addition to this rotator cuff pain. Right. I, always, I always get an x-ray if someone comes in. I start with an x-ray to see if there's some underlying arthritis or something like that. Yeah, the best test for sure, get both an x-ray and an ultrasound, um, absolutely. Okay, what about MRI? MRI is a very good test. Um, I like to think of it as one for surgery planning mostly. Okay. okay, so not the first line. It's helpful when you're thinking about planning or doing an operation, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's uncomfortable for patients. Uh, they can be claustrophobic, takes a while, and uh, so I would usually leave that for uh, if the initial steps are not working. Okay. Just down back a little bit, John, are there any specific tests that you do in the office that are say, oh man, when I see this test is positive, I'm like, this person's got a rotator cuff tear. Good yeah, question. yeah, absolutely. It was a good question. There's a ton of tests. Most of them are not too specific, but things like having trouble reaching. So I test their active motion. How far up can you reach? Yep. How far out to the side can you reach with your elbow? Um, 
And if those things are abnormal despite the early pain treatments, then you probably have a problem. Okay. Um, we also test the strength of the tendon. So, you know, I say if you're turning a pop can down, pardon me, and if that is not strong, then that's a good sign that, that the tendon at the top, supraspinatus, might be torn. Okay, so we've got the history, we've got the physical exam, we've got the diagnostic tests. Where do you start for treatment? So pain is the biggest problem, so I think we should start by treating the pain. So I would start with Tylenol, an anti-inflammatory, the two work together better than alone. Okay. And then physiotherapy can help a ton. So I would get in to see your physiotherapist within a week or two, self-refer, see your family doctor. Those are the super important things. And we're big advocates of physiotherapy. In general, I think for most orthopedic problems, it's a great place to start. Yeah, especially with shoulder stuff, I think physiotherapy is really important. I agree, I start that right away. Absolutely. Okay, okay. next step. So if you're doing physio and pain is a big problem despite those treatments, despite modifying your activities, maybe use a bit of ice, a cortisone injection is the quickest route to pain relief. Whoa, I hear that cortisone injections hurt a lot. That is a common, common, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, totally. It's something we hear all the time. Yes. And, and I think anytime you put a needle into a sore spot, it's going to hurt. So yeah, I would say the average cortisone response, and this is generally, I would consider outside the joint, so it's not in a joint, it's around the tendons. Here's Here's our model, so between the tendons and the bony roof of the shoulder, we can steer a needle into there pretty easily by touch. Yep. And we put in some freezing at the same time as that cortisone. People might have a bit of a flare of pain in the next day or two because you put a needle into that very sore spot. But many patients will report significant pain relief in the weeks following. And you know, if we get lucky, sometimes we break the pain cycle, it can kind of get you back to normal. Uh, a good response would be maybe three months of pain relief and then we got to do something else. Okay. And I was, I was kind of joking obviously because everyone comes to us saying, oh, it hurts so much. I'm like, yeah. probably the injection part might have been related to the person that was administrating it or your position or whatever. It's yeah. not the injection itself that hurts. That's right. Yeah. And you put freezing in. I, I think the other cool thing about putting freezing in is it has sort of a diagnostic component, right? If you freeze the area and pretty quickly the person's like, yeah, I got relief and that sort of reconfirms your diagnosis of rotator cuff Absolutely. Uh, that's, that's a huge part. A diagnostic yeah. component to the freezing. Okay. So let's say you've uh, had someone, you've done some physio, you've given some acetaminophen or some anti-inflammatories. Uh, and they've altered whatever they're doing that's bringing it on. You've tried an injection and there's, it worked for a bit, but then pain came back again. Yeah, so this is where I would say, tell me about the physio you're doing. So physio, I think if try for physio is about three months of exercises. It's a progression with your therapist directing it. And it's about you doing exercises. So it's about you using elastic bands to strengthen these small, tiny muscles. We're not talking gym style exercises yet. We're talking about elastic bands and those little motions to get these extra cuff muscles sharing the load and working in coordination, okay? Okay, how many injections can I get? Mm. Yeah, great question. Uh, so <clears throat> there's not really a limit, but I think that they usually don't help as much as time goes on. So I would usually do one injection, maybe two or three, depending on the scenario If someone really wants to avoid surgery, is having trouble with the pain, uh, but benefiting from the injections, I'd say I'd do perhaps up to three, but then you got to take a hard look and say, what's going on deep inside here? What's, what's, where are we headed? And that's probably where it differs from a knee, where you're treating an arthritic knee that is going to continue to be arthritic until you do something more definitive. Often we'll serially inject those knees over and over, and some are like, well, I have my knee injected like eight times. Can I do that in my shoulder? And usually the approach is different. Yeah, different okay. if we're trying to like solve it. Yeah, solve a problem. Yeah. Okay. All right, so is there any role for surgery in rotator cuff pathology? Yes. So rotator cuff tears, about 80% of them, of all comers, we can treat without surgery. So there's, there's maybe a 20 to 30% that, that, that Canadian surgeons would generally treat with surgery because it's necessary and beneficial. Uh, it's a big recovery, so we don't hop there right away. Okay. What is the surgical procedure then? So. Generally, we've got our ultrasound, uh, good quality ultrasound, perhaps an MRI, and we know the size of the tear, okay? And we should probably talk about a little bit about the size of the tear. Yes. But um, the, the procedure is to, is to fix the tendon. So we can do it either by making an incision, 
few centimeters wide over the shoulder and stitching the tendon back to the bone or we can do it with a scope or an arthroscopy where we look in with a camera and we bring our tools through small little incisions and we're repairing the tendon that's what we're doing and i think that's a really good point so what a lot of people need to understand is that where the muscle joins the tendon and the tendon attaches to the bone it's usually not a tear in the muscle it's a tear either at that junction or at the insertion so there can be like a hole like almost like in a blanket or it can actually pull off the bone. There's a couple of different kinds of tears you could have. Yeah, let me give you a few analogies. So the average tear, we would say, is degenerative. That means it's like kind of like age-related, okay? Wear and tear. Age. <laughs> and, and so think of it like, you know, you got a pair of jeans, you're wearing them for a long time. All of a sudden, the knee starts to get thin. I don't know if my knee is here, but, but, the, but all of a sudden, one day you get this hole in the fabric. Nothing dramatic happened, but you got this hole. So that's the average tear. So now you can charge twice as much for those jeans. <laughs> And my kid will wear them all day long. <laughs> that's sure. way cool. Okay. okay. In winter. <laughs> so that's the average tear. Uh, and, then, and then sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll hear you got a partial thickness tear or something like that. My analogy for that is if you had a 12-strand rope, you know, braided rope, if we cut one or four strands of that 12, that would be some fraying. It would be a partial tear. It can certainly give you pain, but the tendon is not falling apart. Okay. So those are important distinguish, distinguishing factors along with the size of the tear and how the quality of the muscle is. Okay. Cool, all right, now you mentioned open procedure yeah. or arthroscopic procedure. So let's say I'm a viewer and yeah. somehow I paid attention right up till this point and I'm wondering, should I have my rotator cuff repaired open or through a scope if it comes to that? Yeah, you know, generally we haven't been able to prove there's a lot of difference in the number scales we've got and the old-fashioned mainstay uh, would be open surgery for sure. Uh, most surgeons would suggest scope-based surgery because it's perhaps a little bit easier to see the other problems going on in the shoulder and the incisions are smaller, there's perhaps a little bit less scar tissue, but at the end of the day the same thing should be happening down deep inside. Uh, there might be a little bit of pain relief benefit from the scope, but both unfortunately are quite uncomfortable for a few days. Okay, so basically surgeon preference. If you're seeing your surgeon and they're like, oh, I'm gonna do it open or I'm gonna do it arthroscopically, they're still both valid ways to repair Absolutely, the yeah, the well done either way would be a very similar outcome. And you want your surgeon to do what they're good at, what they're comfortable with. Yes, that's super important. Okay, so lastly, so now you've had surgery, what am, I, what am I looking at recovery? I go home, I get to go back to work like the next day? Yeah, no, the recovery oh. is kind of long, unfortunately. Okay. And I usually say, hey, have you had a knee scope perhaps? Because they might have that in their head where knee scopes, you know, some people are, 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 are doing fine a week or two later. Yes. The rotator cuff takes a long time and the limiting step is that tendon healing to bone. I tell people it takes three months for it to heal. Okay. So that's a long time. To protect it, we usually suggest a sling for about six weeks most of the time say sling except for a bathing and physiotherapy so sleeping with it yep. not supposed to drive in a sling it's a real hassle so so like a, a bricklayer or a nurse that's lifting heavy patients those people are going to have some significant time of work and have to kind of plan it yeah you know so if you're doing repeated overhead lifting a painter if, yeah if you're doing heavier work then you're looking at you know approximately four to six months till you get back to that wow. if you're doing desk work and you can do your job in a sling i would take two weeks off to start and then it varies for everyone. Okay. Okay, so recapping rotator cuff pathology. We know what the rotator cuff is. It's the muscles around your shoulder that help it rotate. You can have some tendonitis. You can have some tearing. That can be partial tear, full thickness tear. Yeah. We treat this usually with some sort of analgesic, yeah. uh, some physiotherapy. Um, if it does not get better, we consider some cortisone injections with some freezing. Yeah. Hopefully that works. If that doesn't work, it might come to surgery. Yeah. If you're gonna have surgery, it could be an open procedure or an arthroscopic procedure, both of which have a fairly long recovery period after. Yeah. Did I miss anything? No, no that's it. I paid attention. A to, a to Z. That is awesome. awesome. We'd like to thank Dr. Haverstock for joining us this week. And if you like this video, please like it and subscribe to our channel. And uh, don't worry about the green screen back there. Later, we're going to fill that in with a full OR so oh, that they won't know we're in Dr. Okay. Winnie's basement right now. That's right. And uh, remember, you are in charge of your own health. See you we'll next. see you next time.